Well, good evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study here at Cedarville Baptist Church. Uh, we hope that you can join us and be a part of our study tonight. Uh, we'll take some time to pray in just a few moments. Uh, just to give you an update, uh, we are so glad and so thankful for those who have exercised their faithfulness and stewardship. Uh, many of you have embraced our online giving. We thank you for that. Uh, we've started to see some uh, gifts come in through the mail this week also. And I don't want to overemphasize it, but uh, it is important that uh, we continue uh, to give to the work of God through the local church. And um, again, we look forward to the time we can do that again as an act of worship through uh, our worship service. And so uh, we're th certainly thankful for those who are, are using the alternatives uh, until we can come back together. I hope that you're doing well. I have had opportunity to cross paths with uh, some of you. I've seen a couple of folks at uh, the grocery store and uh, at the post office. That's pretty common around Cedarville. That's where we cross paths with a lot of people. Uh, have reached out by telephone, have had some reach out to me and uh, contacted me through different texts, and uh, that's certainly encouraging as well, and I really do appreciate that. And so uh, it's good to have a lot of folks uh, uh, joining us. Uh, glad to have Lynetta here and, and Brother George Robertson and George Hickman, uh, Brenda Blizzard's on board. Uh, Lynetta and I were listening earlier today to the live stream of Pastor Danny Nagati, uh, from the Ani Beach Fellowship uh, there in Kenya. Uh, he's been on every day, and he has just been an incredible blessing to me. Uh, he's really been pastoring me through this. And so there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of live stream, and, and even after the fact to be able to go back and even listen to some of our local pastors who are using this same venue to be able to reach out to their congregations. Uh, I have been in contact with many of them as we've talked about our approach and uh, the things that we're doing. Uh, to some of us, the technology is is new. Some, it's not necessarily new, but we've never used it in this way before, and so it's something that we have to uh, try to learn. And we're excited about getting familiar with this because we'd like to make this a regular part uh, of our services even after we come back together. Uh, we have a pretty good radius uh, of people that we draw from, probably about a 30-minute radius uh, to our church. And so particularly midweek, it can be difficult for people to uh, get out and uh, to be able to have a part in the midweek service because of the hour uh, especially if they have young children, they have to get to bed to get up to school the next day. And so uh, through streaming, I'm hoping that we'll be able to include more of those, particularly in this in this midweek service. Uh, a little bit later, after we do some Bible study, uh, we're going to talk about some prayer requests. And let me encourage you again uh, to call or to uh, text or, or, or email or, or through the website. However you want to do that, you can get uh, request to us. Uh, I'm going to be updating that sheet probably tomorrow or Friday. I may wait till Friday uh, to see if any additional requests come in, and then that will be posted on the um, on the website. So you'll still have that as well. And um, so uh, we want to make that available to you. Um, also, I had mentioned, and we'll continue to do this through this series. Uh, the outline for tonight's message is on the website. Uh, it's right on the home page there. So I know some of you uh, like uh, like to have the outlines. Uh, I thought of trying to do some way of of having the um, PowerPoint in the background, but if you've done this, you realize that everything shows up in reverse in the screen as we do it. So that didn't work out too well. That was a that was an epic fail. And so I'll do my best to, to be very clear about uh, the aspects of the outline where we fill in the blank. 
Well, let's go ahead and uh, prepare to get started in our, our Bible study. I want to introduce something new to you tonight that will take us through the next 12 weeks, I think is relevant to what we're facing as a nation and uh, to give us some understanding and some encouragement from the Word of God as we study. So let's look to the Lord in prayer and uh, ask for his guidance tonight. Father, we are thankful that we have this venue to gather tonight. And uh, Lord, I pray for our fellow churches uh, throughout uh, our community. I know that are meeting tonight and are using this same venue to reach out to their people. Uh, for some, completely unfamiliar with this technology and, and it's really just starting to unfold. Uh, Lord, I, I thank you that we have it at our availability. And I pray as pastors do their best to use this to reach their congregations, God, what more encouragement could there be than for our congregations to respond to this venue so that we know that we're connecting with them and so that we're ministering with them uh, as a pastor and a pastor's heart uh, to feel distant from the people that you've been called to shepherd. Uh, God, it does uh, create a, a heaviness. And so, God, we're glad that to know that we can make this connection. Father, I pray that you be with us as we study the word tonight. I pray that you would, uh, uh, your people would find encouragement in the things that we look into and guide us through your spirit and all those things that we'll look at tonight. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wanted to start something new. We were doing a series on the book of Deuteronomy on Wednesday night. And I want to pause that for now. Uh, and I wanted to come something that I thought would be an encouragement to you and really kind of parallel uh, some of the challenges that we're facing uh, as a nation. And uh, the Bible speaks to those things very clearly. Uh, this is a 12-week series on the Minor Prophets. Uh, I'm calling it the major message of the Minor Prophets. Now, we understand Minor Prophets doesn't refer to their content, but yet the size of the content. If you understand how the Old Testament is laid out, it's it, it really helps you kind of understand the Scripture a little better. Uh, you have the first five books, which are the books of the law, the books of Moses. We sometimes call them the Pentateuch followed by 12 books we call historical books, which is the history of God's people and the nation of Israel. And then you move into five uh, poetic books and then five major prophets, called major prophets because of, again, the size of the content. Uh, books like Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah, Lamentations and Ezekiel. Uh, and then you follow that with what we call these minor prophets, not minor in message, just minor in size. And uh, the message is still very important. And you have these 12 books that finish out the Old Testament. And so if you can put those into those categories and remember those categories, it will help you a great deal. Uh, tonight, we're going to start in the book of Obadiah. So if you would like to turn to your concordance or to your uh, table of contents to the front of your Bible, that might be helpful. Uh, it's a very tiny book, just one chapter, uh, only 21 verses. Uh, if you have, I have a thin line Bible, and so it falls, uh, you know, just after uh, the book of Amos and just before the book of Jonah. But in my Bible, it's only a page and a half, so it's very easy to, to keep flipping back and forth and missing it on each side. And uh, as Royce Williams would probably tell us, uh, in, in my Bible, it's page 935, which won't help you unless you have a Bible uh, that's laid out exactly like mine. But uh, we'll give you some time to find the book of Obadiah. And so we're going to take these 12 books chronologically. Uh, so we're not following them in the order in which they uh, follow script, uh, follow in the in the Old Testament uh, canon. And uh, I think it's important to do that. If you have ever uh, had an opportunity, or, or if you can, get yourself a chronological Bible. I have, a, I have one that's put out by Reese, the Reese Chronological Bible. And uh, that is very helpful because what that does is helps us to understand uh, how these prophecies and these different Old Testament prophets, where they fit into the history of Israel. 
Uh, they're prophesying during that time that I told you those 12 historic books. Uh, the chronological Bible will place them into the point of where they were prophesying during the time of Israel's history. Uh, some of these prophets prophesied uh, in, during the divided kingdom, uh, so they specifically prophesied to the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, others were specific to the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, some were before uh, God's people went into captivity. The northern kingdom was eventually carried off into captivity to uh, Syria. And uh, then, of course, Judah to Babylon. And there were some who were prophets who brought God's message about the impending judgment if they didn't turn from their sins and their rebellion and what the outcome would be. There were those prophets who prophesied during these captivities, and then there were some who prophesied uh, after as well. And so that's why I want to kind of take this uh, chronologically here as we look at this. Now, one of the things is it records God's honest evaluation of the, the nation of Edom. That's what we're going to talk about tonight, the nation of Edom. And we're going to answer that question to parallel that. Uh, could America ever disappear? Uh, I think with the mindset of most Americans, that would be difficult for us to even contemplate. Uh, we consider ourselves a worldwide superpower. And to think that something so powerful, uh, something so strong could ever cease to exist. But that thinking is, is really outside of the context of, uh, of what is realistic. I mean, it's really kind of an arrogant attitude. It's kind of a prideful attitude. Not that I'm, I am proud to be an American without question. But at the same time, we need to make sure that uh, we're thinking correctly. Uh, we see just within this coronavirus how a single sickness can overtake the whole world. And um, thankfully, we're trying to get a handle on this, and I think they are, and I think they will. Uh, but uh, to think that, you know, we will just always exist as we are, that may or may not be true. And so that's what we want to kind of parallel with Obadiah's prophecy to uh, the nation of Edom. And uh, we're going to see how that plays out here tonight as we parallel that. Now, biblical Edom was named for Esau. Remember Esau? He was uh, Jacob's twin brother. Uh, Jacob uh, and Esau were uh, uh, Isaac's and, um, and Rebekah's children. And uh, we understand what happened in that time frame where Jacob, his name means grabber. He was a deceiver uh, through the prompting of his mother. He deceived his father uh, to take away Esau, who was the older, born first, even though they were twins, uh, the birthright. And at the same time, Esau was willing to relinquish that birthright just for a simple hot meal. Uh, he was more concerned about his flesh than he was his future. And so it's from Esau that you have the nation of Edom. And when you look at the history of them, it's not very pretty. When Moses was leading God's people through the wilderness, at one point they came to a place where uh, they were going towards the promised land, and they asked the Edomites, uh, their brothers, their cousins, if they could pass through Edom and they were denied passage. And so that was kind of strike one. Um, later, in about 845 B.C., the Egyptian army attacked Judah, the southern nation, and uh, Israel called on Edom once again and said, look, you know, you're our brethren. Join us in the fight. And they refused. And so that was strike two. The third strike was the fact that in the end, Edom wound up joining Egypt in uh, their pursuit of Judah and the plundering of Judah and even Jerusalem. And so that was really strike three. 
And God was sent. God would send Obadiah to tell the Edomites, your nation is going to disappear from the face of the earth. Now, let's uh, look at this scripture here. We're not going to read all the verses. If you'd like to do that later, I'd encourage you to do so. But let's just get uh, the context of the story as we read through this right now. Uh, picking up in verse 1 where it says, The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and an envoy has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us go up against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. Uh, you are greatly despised. Now look at verse 3. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to earth? You, see, you hear the arrogance? You hear the, the unmitigated pride that's attached to them? Verse 4, uh, though you build high like eagles, though you set uh, your nests among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Now I want you to skip down just a little further to verses 10 through 12. And we'll pick it up from there. He says, because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be cut off forever. Remember, I just told you the history. Uh, they not only did not come to their aid, uh, but they joined the enemy in the battle against uh, Jacob. Verse 11, on the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. Do not gloat over your brother's day, the day uh, of his misfortune, and do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. Now go down to verse 15. Verse 15 and 16, For the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head, because just as you drank on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow and become as if they have never existed. Now I want you to go down to verses 17 and 18 and understand something about these words, these prophecies of warning and even impending judgment, in all these prophecies, there's always a word of hope. There's always a word of hope. And so in verses 17 and 18, he says, But on Mount Zion there will be those who escape, and it will be holy. And the house of Jacob will uh, possess their possessions. Then the house of Jacob will be a fire, and a house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau will be a stubble, and they will set them on fire and consume them so that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. So in other words, Obadiah predicted a time when God would uh, return Mount Zion to the Jews. And by the way, that, that happened, I believe, uh, during the Six-Day War in 1967. And so the main truth here that we discover, whether it's the major prophets or the minor prophets, is the fact that God not only deals with individuals, God also deals with nations. And that's where the parallel comes in, because when we're talking about him dealing with Jacob and we're talking about him dealing with Esau, and we say, well, that's just confined to uh, the lineage of Abraham uh, through Isaac and then Jacob and then uh, Joseph, and, and right on down the line, leading to the lineage of Jesus Christ. But there are some parallels that we learn, there's some principles that we glean about how God deals with nations. And I believe any nation that declares that they're a Christian nation or a God-following nation uh, can look at these parallels and expect the same response from God because God doesn't change. He's the same, you know, he, he is the Lord God. He does not change or Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so uh, we see how that doesn't change. And so we need to keep that in mind as, um, as we bring that together. Now, there's a couple things I want to point out. First of all is God's word to America. God's word to America. What is God's word to us? 
maybe some of you saw the the book that came out in 2012, uh, about a year after the 9/11 terrorist attacks. Uh, Jonathan Kahn wrote a book. It became a bestseller. Seller. It was called The Harbinger. Now, I understand that's a fictional book, but he drew the parallel of um, he drew the parallel of what happened to America on 9/11 to the scripture found in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 10, which says the bricks have fallen down, but we rebuild with smooth stones and the sycamores have been cut down, but uh, we will replace them with cedars. Now, if you read that book, just remember that it is, um, that, that is just a fictional book. And so I wouldn't put too much stock in that. Um, you really don't need a 21st century novel to, to learn that, listen, uh, God does judge nations. And not everything that happens to us, not a pandemic of a virus, not even necessarily the 9-11 terrorist attacks are necessarily the judgment of God. Uh, a lot of ministers took a lot of heat for trying to make that parallel. But in reality, there are certain things because of the nature of sin. And I tried to point this out uh, in our update, that one of the reasons there's, there is viruses, one of the reasons why there are uh, earthquakes and tornadoes, uh, one of the reasons why there are men who are so inanely depraved is because sin came into the world through the disobedience of one man, Adam. And that has just snowballed since that time. Now, there is a remedy to sin, but the remedy to sin is only by being reconciled to God. And the only way, according to the Scripture, to be reconciled to God is through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so that's the only way we're reconciled to Him. And although we can find the forgiveness of sins uh, through faith in Jesus' death on the cross as a substitute for our sin— we find salvation. But my friends, we still live in this human body. We still live in this world, which is also awaiting redemption. You read about that in the book of Romans. And so we find ourselves, whether saved or lost, still susceptible to the circumstances of a world that has been cursed by sin. Now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't do things that bring judgment into the world or allows things that would uh, bring his judgment into the world. Uh, but we'll see that a little bit later on. Now, a couple things that I want you to notice, uh, a couple of principles here that it applies to every nation. First of all, uh, and if you have the outline, nations that reject God disappear in obscurity. Nations that reject God disappear in obscurity. Um, the great danger of the national sin is pride and invincibility. Uh, verse 3 says, The arrogance or the pride of your heart has deceived you. And then it says, you who, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in the loneliness of your dwelling places. Uh, that's a reference to the area of Jordan uh, known as Petra. Uh, I would love to visit there someday. I've been to Israel and to the Holy Land region twice. Uh, I would love to take a, a trip to the other side, the east side of the Jordan River in that Jordan region. Uh, that's where a lot of these places like uh, Edom, uh, Moab, uh, and, and certainly this fortress of Petra is where the Edomites, they, they thought they were just invincible. There was a, a narrow canyon that le led into uh, this area and uh, if you've ever seen pictures of Petra, they, they literally carved these castles into the side of the mountains. And they really believed that they were invincible because of that fortification. But in reality, it, in the end, it didn't save them. Uh, remember, Psalm 917 says, The wicked shall return to the grave and all the nations that forget God. And Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit. Uh, before a fall. Now, now I believe in national pride, okay? Uh, you know, we sometimes see that happen when uh, 
you have this um, something like the Olympics. You know, people are chanting USA, USA. I'm a golf fan, so I like to watch the Ryder Cup. And when the, the American team is, is doing well, yes, they get that chant going on. And there's nothing wrong with national pride. But when you have pride that thinks that you are completely invincible beyond the sustaining hand of God, you're setting yourself up for failure. I mentioned the history of our church and all the things that our church has experienced in 183 years. I mean, the assassinations of presidents, world wars, civil wars, Great Depression, uh, the terrorist attacks. Uh, there were other worldwide epidemics and viruses in the lifetime of our church. So we have had congregations of the past who have, have gone through something very similar to what we have. So this is not like we're forging new ground. And I said before, we're just adding another page to the history of our church where we're going to look back someday and say, well, here's where God showed up and here's what God did. And here's how God uh, carried us through and sustained us and so forth. One of the darkest errors, of course, is that of our American Civil War. And President Abraham Lincoln called for a day of national humiliation, fasting, and prayer. There's a lot of preachers doing that now. Our own president has already, prior to this, declared a national day of prayer. I believe on the 15th of this month, he had declared that. And uh, here's what he said. I wanted to share it with you because it's very profound. He says, we have been the recipients of the choicest boundaries of heaven. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all the things, we, what things were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God who made us. Well, that's, that's a profound statement. That's a deep statement. And President Lincoln understood at, at that very crossroad of the, of the unity of our nation, that it wasn't going to be the might of the northern army to prevail or the might of a southern army to overcome. It would only be the mighty hand of God that would sustain us as a nation. And that, that reality has never, never changed. But we forget some of those things sometimes. And so we have to be careful. You know, there's been a lot of great... Nations. Matter of fact, um, historians tell us there have been 21 great empires of the past. At one time, Egypt was the great empire. Now, Egypt still exists, but it's not a world power by any means. Uh, there was, of course, uh, the Babylonian Empire, uh, followed by the Persians and and and, um, uh, and the Medes, and then following them was the Greeks, and then the Romans. Uh, if you remember, if you've ever studied Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had that vision of that huge statue which represented all those great nations and those great kingdoms. Uh, the Babylonian kingdom was represented by the statue's head, which was made out of gold. And then, of course, the, it was eventually conquered by the Medes and the Persians. They were overcome by them. They were represented by the, the chest and the arms, and they were silver. Uh, and then the Greek uh, empire, which conquer, conquered the Persians, was uh, represented by the, uh, the midsection and the thighs uh, as, uh, as brass. And then the legs of iron, which represented the Roman Empire. And then, then that went down to the feet, which were iron mixed with clay, which kind of represented where we would wind up now. But did you notice each one of those empires were represented by a less valuable uh, mineral or, or metal? And it was showing that each one of them was not able to sustain themselves. Eventually, they were conquered by somebody else. And so we've seen that throughout history. 
Now, I grew up in the era of the Cold War. You know, we our main nemesis during that time was the power, power of the Soviet Union, the USSR. Where are they at now? They, they can barely feed their own people. They can barely exist as, as a nation, you see. And they were very arrogant in regards to their power and their capabilities. But they certainly don't have that power today. And so we need to be careful about how we boast about what we can do and, and, and the resources that we have and the power that we exist, uh, that we, we, uh, we have and realize that um, that can change very quickly. Second thing is this, nations that honor God find refuge. There's always an upside. The nations that honor God find refuge. The psalmist said in Psalm 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And so there is a reality that we find that if, if a nation will if they have departed from God, they need to come back to God. And they need to understand that through repentance, there can be restoration. And one of the books that we'll study is the book of Jonah. Jonah is a prime example of that. Uh, Jonah was sent to Nineveh, and uh, they were some pretty tough people, to say the least. And we'll talk more about that in the details when we study that book. But what happened to that nation? They repented. The king called for national prayer and fasting and repentance, and God spared them because they repented. They turned from their sins. And so uh, there is certainly the avenue by which we can find restoration. You know, people looking for religious freedom established our nation. But sometimes I think we have a hard time understanding what it means to have freedom. Uh, freedom is not necessarily a license to be able to do things that, although you may be free to do, but may cause somebody else harm. Uh, you still have responsibility to other people. And so the people who founded our nation were looking for this religious freedom. And that's why uh, we ultimately came to a point of where it was declared that our country's motto is, In God We Trust. In 1861, the Secretary of the Treasurer, Salmon Chase, at the direction of President Lincoln, he wrote a letter to James Pollock, who was the director of the U.S. Mint. Here's what it said. It said, Dear Sir, no nation can be strong except in the strength of God, or safe except in his defense. The trust of our people in God should be declared on our national currency. Uh, you will cause a device to be prepared without necessary delay with a motto expressing uh, the, uh, in the fewest and tersest words, possibly this nation's recognition. And, and of course, Pollock came up with, in God we trust. Now, where did he get that from? He probably got it from Francis Scott, Scott Key's song that we ultimately adapted as our national anthem. Now, we know the first verse. There are two verses. The first verse of the national anthem we are all very well acquainted with. Uh, the fact of the matter is we don't always sing that second verse. Matter of fact, if you go to a sporting event, they're not going to sing the second verse. Uh, the only place I have ever been in public where they have sang the second verse, uh, we go to the... Uh, Thresherman's Convention up in Kinsers, PA, every year. It's a antique tractor gathering, and uh, it's kind of a family tradition for us. And those folks up there, every morning, it's a four-day event, every morning, they have someone sing the national anthem. They also open in prayer. But they sing the national anthem, and uh, they always sing the second verse. Now, here at the church, a lot of times during Fourth of July, Memorial Day, or whatever, we may sing the national anthem. It's in our hymnal. And the second verse says, Then conquer we must, when our cause it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. And, and we believe that's where Pollock got that phrase that is now embossed in our money. 
I find it interesting, about 10 years ago, then President Obama spoke at the University of Jakarta in Indonesia, and he claimed that our U.S. Uh, motto was E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. Well, the mainstream media didn't call him on that at all, but I was glad Congress did make note of it and uh, made sure that he understood that our motto is, in God we trust. What's interesting was his response. His response was this, and I'm quoting. He says, I trust in God, but God helps those who help himself. But no, Mr. President, that's not in the Bible. Uh, we are helpless apart from God. And anything we can do is not going to help God. We need to be at his mercy and experience his grace and his loving kindness. Why? Because it's our trust in God that will ultimately give us the success that we can say, look, it's not us. It's the God of heaven, the God of heaven and earth who has sustained us. President Ronald Reagan, and I grew up in the Reagan era. That's when I really started to take an active role in, in following what was happening in our, our nation politically. And Reagan made this statement. He said, if we forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be one nation gone under. And he was so very right. Well, the second thing that I want to conclude with is this, is God's word to me or you could say God's word to you. I've tried to teach you when you're studying God's word, there's three questions you always should ask. But one is, what does the scripture mean to the original people to who it was written? We don't want to take things out of context. We want to make sure that we understand the context in which it was written. Not that it doesn't mean that it doesn't have principles for us to follow, but understand what the original purpose of Obadiah going to the nation of Edom and pronouncing this impending judgment of God. The second question is, what is the general spiritual principle in the scripture? Because again, God is consistent. And how he deals with one nation, he's going to deal with every nation. And so we can draw some parallel principles. And that's what we're doing in this study. We're drawing parallel principles in this study. But then the third question is always this. What is God saying to me? I'm always amazed that I can preach a single sermon and get a variety of responses. And if you would put some of the people together that were sitting in the same service, you would wonder if they even heard the same message. Well, that's the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit knows what your needs are tonight. He knows what your anxiety is about this whole crisis we're facing. He knows what the challenges are in your mind as you're trying to uh, figure it all out, make sense of it. But the Holy Spirit of God will take God's word and will give something just for you, tailor-made for you. And I've seen him do it. He's done it for me. He will do it for you. So those are the three questions that we ought to, uh, to ask. Now Esau and his descendants founded Edom and they are a picture of the sinful nature uh, versus the spiritual nature. Esau's attitude is one that we should certainly avoid. Uh, let me give you a reference in the New Testament that, that clarifies that a little bit. In Hebrews chapter 12, the 12th chapter of Hebrews in verses 15 through 17, it says, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, and that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. Now listen to what he says in verse 16 of Hebrews 12. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance. You see, there was no place for repentance. What that means is he was not willing to repent. He was not willing to confess that he was, in fact, sinful in his actions. Had he done so, just like the Ninevites, he could have found forgiveness, he could have found the restoration of God, but he didn't. And so he becomes an example of that rebellion. And the nation that, that 
flowed out of him, the nation of Edom, was destroyed also because they had embraced that same attitude. Well, let me give you a couple of things, two personal lessons here as we wrap this up tonight. The first one is, I can't ignore my neighbor when he suffers. Boy, is that timely? I can't ignore my neighbor when he suffers. Remember, we said that was one of the biggest problems. Twice, God's people called on them as as kindred spirits, as cousins. They said, no, we're not going to help you. As a matter of fact, we're going to join the enemy in the end, and we're going to steal stuff from you and just glory in your destruction. That principle for us is I cannot ignore my neighbor when he suffers. That's the basic sin of the Edomites. A paraphrase of Obadiah chapter 1 and verses 12 through 13 says, Godless foreigners invaded and pillaged Jerusalem. You stood there and watched. You were as bad as they were. That's exactly what God told them. You should have been there to help your neighbor. And what did you do? You just stood there and watched. That's a sad thing. I said that in this crisis, there's great, unique opportunity for us to reach out to people. Now, we try to do that on a regular basis because that's part of the mission of the church. Jesus told a parable that illustrated that. There was a Pharisee who came to Jesus, and uh, Jesus made that declaration to him. He said the two greatest commandments are this, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And he said the second is like unto it. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, this Pharisee, this religious guy, he was looking for a loophole. He thought he was pretty smart. He says, well, then who's my neighbor? All right, let's be specific. Who's my neighbor? And then Jesus tells that familiar story that we refer to as the Good Samaritan. This man was beaten up and left for dead by robbers. And three men passed. The first two were directly connected to the brotherhood of of Israelites, of Jews. And they didn't do a thing to help them. One was even a Levite. The third man was a Samaritan. The Jews hated the Samaritan. They were the half-breeds. They would go out of their way not to have any contact with them. They despised them. Jesus said it was the Samaritan who stopped, mended this man's wound, loaded him up, took him into the city, found him a place of safety, And then even told the man, here's the money, take care of him, and if I return and you need more, I'll pay his bill. And what a remarkable thing that is. The point of the parable was this. Jesus was making it clear, your neighbor is anyone who has a need that you can meet. That puts it in perspective. When we reach out to people as a church, I don't ask them if they have membership in our church or a church of like faith. No, that's not a a prerequisite. We help a lot of people, very honestly, who have never even been in our church. They live in our community. They may live in our county. They may even go to another church, and it might even be a church that's not just like our church. But according to the scripture, they're our neighbor if they have a need. As you know, when we observe the Lord's table on the first Sunday of the month, along with that, we take up a benevolence fund, the fellowship fund offering, which is overseen by our board of deacons. And that money is set aside, and it's only used for one thing. We give it away. We give it away to people, whether they know about our church or not. We meet their need, and we demonstrate that, we meet that need and demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ when we do it. We don't want it back. We don't want them to try to think that, well, now they owe us something. Oh, we should at least come to their church. No, we don't require that. There's no strings attached. 
And so the first principle is that aspect of the fact that um, we understand that I can't ignore my neighbor when he suffers. The second thing is this, and uh, we'll wrap this up. My only source of security is Jesus. My only source of security is found in Jesus Christ. And um, we need to understand that. Remember the story, uh, the Edomites thought that their source of security was found in Petra. If you've never seen that rock formation and the way they carved the castles in the mountains, go ahead and Google that afterwards. And uh, I'm sure you can get some pictures of it on the internet. And it's, it's a pretty remarkable place. But as great as a, a fort it was, it was not enough to help them ultimately overcome their enemies. And we need to understand that our security is in Jesus Christ. Well, we'll find that out real quickly when things start to go bad. Psalm 20 and verses 7 and 8. Yesterday, I think it was, when I was listening to Pastor Danny Nagati, he concluded his devotional with us with this verse. In Psalm 20, 7 and 8 says, Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. Isn't that wonderful? Human nature wants to boast in our natural resources, in a strong military, in a strong economy. We see how fast that can change, right? The psalmist understood. He said, you know what? We understand that it's not in chariots or horses, but it's in the name of our God who sustains us. I'm going to talk to you about that Sunday morning. I hope you can join us at 1030 this Sunday as we go to the Psalms once again to find encouragement. David's writing a psalm in a unique place. It's in a cave. And so Sunday morning, I'm going to talk to you about how to behave when you're in a cave. And some of you by now probably feel like you're in a cave. And I want to give you some words of encouragement on Sunday, how you can know for sure that uh, God is your refuge and that God is sustaining you. Listen, understand this. There is hope for any nation and any person who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. I think one of the reasons why we've seen the remarkable prosperity that we have had as a nation but that also means those times of difficulty, the wars and the depressions and past viruses and all the other things that we've experienced. We have come through them because at times we've had men like Abraham Lincoln who said, look, we have forgotten our God. Understand something, our founding fathers most of them were Christians. Not all of them were Christians. Some were simply what we would refer to as deists. Um, Jefferson, um, Benjamin Franklin was a deist. I don't necessarily know that he was a Christian. I know the Wesleys, John and Charles Wesley, were contemporaries of him and had witnessed the gospel to Franklin on many occasions. But a deist at least has sense enough to realize there's something greater than themselves. They realize that there is, is a God. I'd rather have a, a deist than an atheist any day. But understand, the principles by which our nation was forged was based upon Judeo-Christian values. My friends, the worst thing we can do is forget the God who really sustained us as a nation all this time. So find those parallels, look at them, and find encouragement in them. And I trust that uh, uh, that you'll find encouragement in them. Well, I'm going to lead us in prayer in just a moment. Um, again, if you have some prayer requests, uh, glad that you've joined us. I've seen some other have come online since I've been talking. Uh, nice to have Michael James here and 
and uh, my daughter-in-law, Katie. Uh, I think I saw her mom had signed in. Bill Kirk is with us. I hope you're doing well, Bill. You and Helgi, I know that you've been facing some, some challenges in your health. Um, good to see Shannon Del Calo. Uh, Steve Shepard's there. Brother Steve, glad to see you, preacher. Uh, trust God is, is working in your church down there in Newport. Uh, Brother Todd Adams, uh, I'm broadcasting from here because uh, one of the videos I did in the room with just uh, the paneling behind me and Todd offered to make some backdrops for me. I was going to have him do some sort of some palm trees and some islands things telling you I was sequestered somewhere on a desert island with Wi-Fi. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll just do it from my church study here, give you a little bit of background there. Uh, good to have Jimmy Lamentier on board. Thank you, Brother Jim, you and uh, Miss Nancy. God bless you. Uh, yeah, there's Terry Branch. God bless you, Terry. Good to see you on. Uh, Denise Gossiboon. Uh God bless you, Denise. Uh, uh, trust God is uh, meeting your needs. Uh, uh, Belinda Jordan and the Jordan family. God bless you guys. Good to see you. Um, my wife's watching. That's good to know. Uh this is such a great venue, but we need to continue to pray for each other. And uh, that's what I'm doing these days, my friends. I, I, I do that anyhow, but I'm doing it even more, is walking the sanctuary. And uh, as I walk the sanctuary, and I trust God and the Spirit of God to bring to mind as I walk through those pews, the places you sit, and gives me opportunity to, to pray for you. And so you've been prayed for, and you're going to be prayed for. Uh, in the days ahead, I'm, I'm going to have uh, at different times one of the deacons join me, and we're going to continue to do that. And I know you're praying for us as, as we try to lead you in these, in these unique times. And we wait to see what God is doing. Um, make sure that, uh, again, about the prayer sheet, if you have updates, get those to me at least by through tomorrow. I'll wait till Friday to go ahead and publish that. So uh, if there's any updates, uh, be praying for, for Mrs. Betty Pierce. She's in the in, in Sparrow Hospital. Uh, even us volunteers, uh, we can't get in to see them anymore, but uh, uh, be praying for her. Uh, be praying for John Watson. John uh, was able to join us uh, on, the, on the live feed on Sunday. Uh, John's going in for a heart cath um, very soon, and so we want to be praying for John uh, and certainly for Rose and his family. Uh, we miss Brother John, former deacon. Uh, what a godly man, and we want to lift him up in prayer. And uh, let's just continue to keep close tabs with each other uh, through this time and be praying and lifting each other before the throne of grace because, as I said, God is our refuge. He is our strength. And he is a very present help in the time of trouble or the time of difficulty. Let me lead you in prayer, and uh, we'll close out our session tonight. Father God, I thank you for the privilege of coming to the throne to think that we have an audience at the throne room of heaven, in the presence of the maker of heaven and earth. We have it because of our high priest, Jesus Christ. Father, we're thankful that we can be reconciled to you through his sacrifice on the cross. God, in these days ahead, maybe it will sharpen our prayer lives. Lord, it certainly got people thinking about spiritual things again. Lord, I pray that uh, we would take advantage of that. Lord, that we would be there as followers of Christ to show the peace that we can have even in the midst of difficulties because of your presence and because you are our source of strength and refuge. Father, I pray uh, tonight for our membership and God, for those who are uh, facing physical difficulties. We think about Betty Pierce, one of our, our longtime members. And, and God, what a sweet spirited lady. I pray for her son, Mark. And uh, Lord, I just pray uh, as this difficulty of being in the hospital and, and having limited access to uh, to her pastor, to, I don't know, in regards to uh, her, her son or how easily people can get in to see her. But God, I pray that you would just be with her and strengthen her through this time of what would be a really kind of an ultra quarantine. Lord, we pray for Brother John Watson and Lord, that you be with him as uh, this pending procedure, this heart catheterization. 
God, I pray that you would guide the doctors and God, that uh, all would go well and that you would bring him back to full health. Father, we do pray that for those who are meeting these physical challenges in their lives, God, that you would meet them. It's a very scary time to now have to contemplate any kind of hospital stay or visit, uh, even going to the doctors as I talked to one of our folks at the post office today. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to meet us in our needs, continue to help us not to be anxious, Lord, to over, not to overreact, but God, to just trust you from day to day, continuing to lift each other in prayers. God, to take advantage of the opportunities to meet our neighbor's needs as they come into our path. Father, I thank you for your goodness and your blessing. But we're thankful that we know that we can be uh, under your wing. God, in the comfort of your presence, God, we will give you thanks for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, you know I miss you. I love you. I am looking with great anticipation that day when we get back together for corporate worship. But until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and by all means, stay holy. God bless you, and good night.